morning, everyone. Hi, everybody. This is Emma, Emma Guest Gonzalez, president of GANIC. Uh, welcome to our February monthly meeting. I can see the numbers are going up as our attendees are coming in. We are going to be starting in just a moment. I am just getting actually, my copy of the agenda printed out. And as we get started, I'm going to share my screen and show you all tonight's agenda just to make sure um, we're all on the same page. All right, so I'll share that while everyone is coming in. We also have the transcript, some closed captioning. You can turn those on or off at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so let me share my screen. And so you all can see tonight's agenda. Uh, please remember that you can use the chat. And if you want to talk to everybody, make sure it says to everyone. Okay, so there is our agenda. And we'll get started in just a moment. I'll get my printed copy out. Here we go. So as you can see, we'll Please review the agenda and we'll approve it. I will give my report. Then we have Patrick Bringley, GANIC member and author at Met Museum Guard Extraordinaire, who will be presenting to us tonight. We'll have reports from the NFTGA from myself, Jared, and Mark Landman, and then um, committee reports. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Any comments or anything anyone would like to add? You can just put that into the chat. I see here one thing. So, oh, Jonathan, fingers crossed your internet is not unstable for too long. Okay. All right, so if we lose Jonathan for a second, hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> All right. Okay, does that look, so I see the numbers, numbers have slowed down. All right, we've got 38 people. It's a chilly night. So I think people are just hunkered down um, at home, maybe feeling a little sleepy and warm. So this is recorded so everyone can catch up with it at another time too. So if there are no additions to the agenda, we'll proceed with the meeting itself. So welcome, welcome everybody. And it's Great to sort of see everyone here tonight. Um, so my presence report, not, not too long. Just to let you know that you can still renew. All right, our intrepid treasurer is not here tonight, but you can still renew. And we do have our chair of membership here, Anne McDermott, and we'll love people to renew. And if you are attending as a visitor, we would love you to join Gannett. And so if you go to our website under membership, you can find out about joining and you can find out, um, you can see the links to renew. So please do so if you've not done so already, we would love for you to renew. We'd love um, to, to you to come back um, to Gannick if you haven't renewed yet. Um, so far the renewals have been really strong. So we're over the numbers that we had um, expected. So we're very happy about that. Now, a couple things. The Gannick Apple Awards are coming up and tickets are now on sale. We'll get a more detailed report from Matt Baker from the awards committee. And tonight is the last night to vote, okay, for the awards. So you can pick who you want to win. Um, we've got some amazing, amazing, amazing nominees. And if you go to the awards on the Gannick Apple Awards, um, web page. They have their own separate web page, and just even through the through the Gannick website, you can just click on awards, and you'll be brought to the dedicated web page where you can read the awards blog, which will tell you all about the different nominees. So definitely check that out. On the uh, more uh, local, more local uh, front, and more awards, Davler Media and City Guide are doing their their second annual um, Women in Tourism Award. And I was so honored and still thrilled to see my little award um, to have been nominated to have won for a tour guide, uh, thanks to the nomination from the Gannick Board at last year's the first um, Women in uh, Tourism Award ceremony. So nominees are 
open. You can nominate uh, anyone you would like to in the travel and tourism um, business and travel and tourism trade in New York City. And the categories include tour guide and tour operator. Nominees, uh, nominations are due by February 27th, and the event will be on May 9th at City, uh, City Winery. So if you go to the um, cityguideny.com website, and it's under um, WIT, Women in Tourism, but it's also all over their social media, it's all over their webpage, and I did post about it on our Gannett Group Facebook page as well. So please go there, please nominate. We've got so many amazing women in Gannett. I know there are many who are worthy of a nomination. Um, it's actually it's hard to choose. I mean, this really is. I would nominate every single woman who's a Gannett member right now on the spot. So make sure you check that out. Also check out the latest news from WFTGA, from the World Federation of Tourist Guides Associations. February 21st is International Tourist Guide Day, and they're doing events for that. There'll be virtual events. Um, all the different guides associations are um, around the world are, are welcome to participate in. GANIC usually does something for that, or we're celebrating that day in different ways, and tour guides can celebrate um, as well. Um, but there will be a mini um, virtual uh, virtual mini conference on February 22nd there you can register for it and it's open for everyone to attend WFTGA the World Federation GANIC members are part of, of, of WFTGA in two ways um, GANIC is a member as an association and GANIC is a member of NFTGA of the National Federation is also a member that way too. So uh, you are welcome to check out the WFTGA, um, their little virtual uh, mini conference. And I'll be posting about that and you'll get um, information about how to sign up for that too. The newsletter also has information about other events that are going on and including information about in 2024, the World Federation Biennial meeting will be taking place in Siracusa in Sicily. So if you want to plan your Sicilian vacation, that's a great thing to plan around. Um, now, February is a great time to do training. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the D.C. Guild is offering a three-day training session in February. Um, their website, the, and if, the um, Washington, D.C. Guild, has information about that. And that is February 16th, 17th, and 18th. I believe, by the way, oh, 17th, 18th, 19th. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, like a little brain fart right at this moment. But anyway, so that's through the DC Guild. They welcome all GANIC members. Jim Carr, who is president of the DC Guild, is also a GANIC member, and they would love to see us there. It will be led by master trainers from the DC Guild. And once you've done that training and you pass the Guild has a little tests that they do to join the DC Guild, you get a membership and a free one a year's worth of membership in the DC Guild. So um so that's a really nice, a nice option that they're that they're giving. Okay. So that's really it from me. Um it's nice seeing that people are still busy, people are still touring. I think a lot of people are already getting their spring seasons lined up. So now is the perfect time to maybe review some of the great um, digital offerings uh, GANIC has done over the past um, couple of years. And as remember as GANIC members, we've got the whole massive digital library that you can consult if you want to brush up on some of the great sites or some of the um, great virtual fams that we did, you know, go ahead, uh, make sure you can check that out. So that's really it from me. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to um, pass this over to Jonathan Tour who will be introducing this evening's speaker. So take it away, Jonathan. Hey everybody. Uh, I am very excited to introduce Patrick Bringley. I've um, actually had the pleasure to get to know him a little bit as we're uh, waiting for our respective guests at the Met. And uh, I was excited to have this opportunity to introduce him. I, I had in mind that I was gonna be his hype guy um, but it turns out most of the stuff that I wanted to tell you about, he's actually going to describe uh, as he um, begins his talk in just a moment. Um, it's really going to be focused on his book. I think most of you know that Patrick is not only a guide, uh, but he is also an author of a uh, Simon & Schuster published book that is going to be coming out 
uh, in the middle of the month. So I think John Semlak is going to be putting the link in the chat, or you can order directly from Simon & Schuster. I have already pre-ordered my book from my local bookstore, so that is very easy to do. Um, Patrick's piece, uh, uh, or Patrick's book, is largely about his 10 years that he spent at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, as a guard. Um, he's been uh, kind of writing this book for the last couple of years, supposed to come out uh, a little while ago, and uh, because of a delay, he's taken this opportunity to get into the, kind of deep into the tour guiding business. So you can find him at uh, Bowery Boys Walks, you can find him at Untapped New York, uh, and you can pretty much always find him at the Met. We're actually lucky that we uh, have Patrick this evening. This morning, he was at the Met with Good Morning America filming a piece uh, that is going to be airing uh, shortly before the book comes out, uh, which I seem to recall is on the 14th. Um, so Patrick is a Chicagoan by birth, but really uh, he's been here in the city ever since he attended NYU. So he is really a New Yorker at heart. Uh, and I'm excited uh, for all of us to get to hear a little bit more uh, about this project that he's been working on with his book. So I'm going to hand it over to him. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And uh, thank you to Gannick. Um, uh, I've had a great time meeting so many of you. Um, you know, when I describe this organization to people, I say, you know, the great thing about an organization of tour guides is everyone can talk. Everyone is sort of an expert at breaking the ice. So you show up at these meetings with all these strangers, but they're not strangers in an instant. And um, many of you are wonderful New York characters, and that's what I aspire to be more than anything as a, as a New York character. And uh, uh, I'm very moved by the organization that you guys have built and the organization that you guys work so hard to sustain. So thank you for having me. Thank you for letting me be a part. And let me share my screen. All right, I have to pull up this. All right, you guys see me? All right, beautiful. So I wrote a book, as Jonathan kindly said. Um, it's called All the Beauty in the World. Um, and it's a memoir. It's about my experience working as a guard at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, as Jonathan said. Uh, it's sort of a portrait of the Met and its treasures from a guard's up close and intimate vantage. And it's also a personal story. It's you know a story about 10 year critical years of my life um, from about age 25 to 35 that I spent inside the museum. It's been a long time coming, but as Jonathan says, it publishes very soon, uh, February 14th. He had that right from Simon & Schuster. Um, before we do anything else, before I kind of tell you how I came to have the job, I thought I would bring you inside the museum. So of course, this is the Met's facade, which is sort of so wide that you can't get the entire thing into view, which is emblematic of the Met itself. You know, I might be posted inside there for 50 years and you would never know all the hundreds of thousands of objects inside. Um, as a former guard, I can tell you what I see when I look at this facade. So I would think to myself, you know, down there at the South at 80th Street, you've got the parking garage. And then facing north at 84th Street, at the other end, you've got the loading dock. Um, in between, you've got this sweep of majestic marble stairs uh, leading into the Temple of the Met down from the grimy streets of New York City. I can tell you as a guard, I never climbed those stairs. You enter by the loading dock. There is a sentry booth um, where one of my colleagues would be checking in these nondescript white trucks that are arriving that might be carrying a painting on loan from the Vatican or might be carrying, you know, hot dog buns, buns for the kids meals. You can never really be sure. And I would follow that truck down that long ramp where I'd show my credentials at a second century booth and I would enter the Mets vast backstage. Um, now, I don't feel right showing you pictures of potentially sensitive areas, um, but I can paint a word picture sort of easily enough. Uh, the Met sits on 12 acres of Central Park. You can imagine that like a tree, every bit as it is big above ground, it's just that big underground. Um, so I would walk in and it's an endless series of labyrinths, just very gray, concrete, ductwork, piping. And it's where much of the Met's work is getting done. There are empty art crates that are lying all about. 
these are just stock art crates, not that they would be mad at me if I took pictures of the actual ones. And there are yellow signs everywhere that say yield to art in transit. Uh, it's a bit like an ambulance that if you see people with blue latex gloves pushing art, you all step aside. And down here is where you're going to find conservation studios and storage facilities and wood shops and plexiglass shops. And there's a printer and there's working armory where they're repairing, you know, a medieval helmet that went on the fritz or something. And it's also where you're going to find where I'm headed, which is a locker room for more than 500 security guards. So this is just a tiny fraction of them. Um, I'd walk past the uniforms office where there's what well, used to be a cranky wonderful old man named Johnny Buttons, who was mending and tailoring our suits. Uh, I once heard a guard say to him, he said, you know, Johnny, you got it made. You just sit in this office all day sewing buttons. And Johnny looked at him and he said, yeah. And what do you do? He said, stand around and talk to the freaking statues. So then they both had a good laugh. So I would pass by Johnny's office. I'd go into the uniforms office or sorry, I'd go into the guard's locker room. And that would be loud with, you know, men standing around and shaving and eating egg sandwiches and reading the, the post and having conversations in half a dozen languages. And um, I would get changed into my stiff polyester dark blue suit. There I am. I'd affix that wine red clip on tie and I'd put on a pair of the company's shoes. So I, I had them give this to me when I left. This is um, my sign out card for nine pairs of shoes that I ran through over the course of my 10 years at the Met. We also, per the union contract, we get $80 annually for socks. That's called a hose allowance. Shows up in your paycheck. And I'd head straight over to the dispatch office. Um, there, the dispatcher would find my name on a big board, and he'd say something like, Bringley, Section H. And that meant that I was going to the Egyptian wing, or he'd say Section R, which might mean I'm in Africa or the ancient Americas or modern or Section A, which is the original old core of the Mets, where the medieval wing is, the 1880 building. And um, I would report to the section. Oh, but let's, let's suppose that it's, it's when I'm first starting out as a guard at the Met. And my home section was the old master, Section B, uh, the European paintings. So if I was going to section B, I would report to the chief's desk, which is on the Great Hall balcony, and I'd be assigned my posts for the day, actually three posts. I would uh, get on to my C post for 30 minutes, and then rotate to the B post for 30 minutes, and then to the A post for 30 minutes, and then I'd be down on my break. And then I'd do the whole thing over again. Um, on my break, I might go to the cafeteria and kick on my feet. A lot of guards go into the locker room and you lie down on the wooden benches there like a pharaoh. You have your arms crossed like this because you have to be on your back. You put your tie over your eye, eyes like that. And that's sort of the style in which, which a guard gets some rest. Um, and then about a half hour before the museum opens to the public, I would get on my post and it would just be totally quiet. The only sound would be my footfalls on these wonderfully soft, forgiving wooden floors that you see it makes a big difference. You come to treasure floors like this when you're standing for eight or 12 hour days. In fact, I was trained by this very colorful woman um, from Finland and her math was, she said, a 12 hour day on wood is like an eight hour day on marble An eight hour day on wood is like nothing. <laughs> Your feet will barely hurt. And there's some truth in that. So it would be totally quiet. And I'd be all alone except for figures that Goya painted or Rembrandt painted or Rubens painted. There's his wife, Helena, there. And one of the many beautiful things about being a guard is there would be nothing and no one to bring me back down to earth to make me think thoughts that were necessarily rational or sane. I could think whatever thoughts that I wanted about these vibrant and magnificent paintings that were in some sense my companions over the course of a long day. And were also these wonderful windows onto these worlds that sometimes were strange and sometimes were kind of oddly familiar. Um, oftentimes I was posted in galleries that looked like this in the, the old days. I, I come to think of this as the Jesus pictures. Um, that was in honor of a man, he was walking through section B. He was probably hunting for sunflowers or water lilies or, you know, Degas ballerina or something. 
And he walked into yet another gallery like this. And he said, God damn it. I'm in the Jesus pictures again. Um, I have to say though, though I'm, I'm not a Christian. I, I adore these pictures. Um, uh, you know, it, it's captivating working in this area and it's like walking in this sort of poignant family photo album of this one man's short, hard life from first century Judea that just gets obsessed over by the old masters. And, um, you know, here's various scenes of his life. Uh, a painting like this one by Bernardo Dadi, it was made in the 14th century. Uh, if you know anything about the 14th century, you know that was a hard luck century. Um, a third of Europe, perhaps, died in the bubonic plague. Bernardo Dadi died right at that time, so likely in the, bar the bubonic plague. And to me, these pictures did not feel sort of distant and churchy and abstract or sort of divorced from my life. They felt very near and very familiar because I think that the emotion in them is so close to the surface. Um, I think it makes good sense why the old masters in an era of calamity and plague would return again and again to scenes from the passion, which is just an old word that means suffering, and which they clearly felt was very close to the center of the human drama. And I felt very privileged to be able to just stand there in the galleries bearing witness, like you see these fellows sort of on the edges of these scenes and old master paintings, bearing witness to this sort of luminously sad scenes, not sort of studying them the way that a curator or a scholar might, um, but rather just being among them the way that a guard is, just facing up to them over the course of the day in all different moods and sort of grappling with what they seem to be about. Um, as a guard, I had the time and space to do that. And I think that that's what the old masters intend. They don't really want us to study the pictures as a, you know, a artifact of art history. They want us to be grappling with what this scene is. And I found great solace in it. Because here's when I'm going to back up and I'm going to tell you about myself. So um, this is a book about, among other things, that's about um, loss. It's about a loss that my my family suffered and the solace and meaning that I found in the galleries after that loss. Um, when I started as a guard at the Met, I was just 25 years old. Previously, I had had a more quote unquote kind of promising job. I worked in the events department at the New Yorker magazine. And I was in the skyscraper here that was literally at the corner of 42nd Street and Broadway. And of course, I felt like I was at the top of the world. It was the kind of prestigious sounding job that impresses everybody and dangerously for a 21 or 22 year old impressed myself. Um, never mind that I hadn't really lived much and I hadn't written anything and I hadn't, you know, really even thought a word of substance in my life. I still naively thought that kind of having an at newyorker.com email address, that that was, you know, that was really something that that meant something. But then when I was working at the New Yorker, um, my brother Tom on the left there got sick. He got got very, very sick. Um, he had what's called a soft tissue sarcoma, which turns out to not often be the sort of thing that you're going to beat. Um, and suddenly my New York City was not so much midtown Manhattan skyscrapers. It was Tom and his wife, Krista's one bedroom apartment in Queens. And then it was a lot, a lot of quiet little hospital rooms at Beth Israel Hospital. And it was clear as day that sort of momentous things were happening in those quiet little rooms. And it was just as clear that sort of the fancy trappings of the Condé Nast building um, didn't mean a whole lot. Uh, the sort of office politics and ladder climbing and rushing about from project to project, you know, it in the wake of leaving the hospital, it felt fake. It felt kind of just sort of like buzzy nonsense. Um, it was such a contrast to the atmosphere in Tom's hospital room, which was more like the atmosphere in those old master pictures, um, just to cut right to the heart of it. You know, on the left here is is a painting of an adoration, an adoration of Christ. And on the right, that's cut from a larger altarpiece of a lamentation. 
And it's interesting how even though one is, you would think the polar opposite of the, the other, that both of these powerful emotions can be present at the same time, adoration and lamentation. Um, I imagine that many of you have spent time at the bedside of someone who um, is suffering with bravery and grace and with an admirable sort of simplicity. And I imagine that you know that your heart sort of brims at the same time as your heart breaks, uh, because it's very terrible, but it's also very, very beautiful. There's so much love, but there's so much pain. Um, and life is kind of stripped down to some very basic essence. There's something very plain going on, but also very mysterious going on. And you've really kind of reached, reached some sort of bedrock. Um, you're witnessing kind of the heart of the heart of the human drama, it sometimes feels. And, you know, what is there to say about it, really? It, it sort of leaves you speechless. Um, and I think that this sort of stillness, this sort of speechlessness under kind of a star of wonder, so to speak, is what the old masters very often seem to be painting. Um, when when Tom died, I decided I wanted to have, oh, I'm sorry, I meant to show that for a moment. I'll, I'll point out on the right here are, is one of many sketches in my book that were done by a very um, talented artist named Maya McMahon. When I started as a, a guard, um, let me get my place here. You know, when Tom died, I decided I wanted to have a job that was nourishing, that was sort of straightforward and honest and didn't involve rushing back to the so-called real world of the office that, in fact, is seemed to me worrying about trifles. And I was kind of speechless, and I wanted to sort of stand still a while, and I chose as a venue the most beautiful place that I could think of. And the early chapters of the book are really about my sort of wide-eyed wonder exploring the museum. When I was a little bit shell shocked, and um, I had a lot of gratitude for the space and the time that I was allowed to sort of commune with these objects that seemed to have profound things to say about life and death and suffering and all the rest of it, not only in the old master wing, but you know, everywhere. But of course, as a guard, um, I didn't just look at pictures all day. Uh, the doors of the museum swing open. And 7 million people come into the Met every year. That's more than the Yankees, Mets, Giants, Jets, Knicks, and Nets combined. Um, and it, it was, of course, my job as a guard to make sure that these people play nicely with um, old and delicate uh, works of art. And for the most part, they really do. They really do play nicely. Um, occasionally, though. Uh, one day I was posted in Section K1, the Greek and Roman wing. A young man was climbing or trying to climb this Venus statue to sit on her lap. And I stopped him and he was very polite. He just kind of didn't know. But then he looked at her with her, her missing head and arms. And he looked all around at this sort of battlefield of men and gods in the Roman wing. And he said, so all this broken stuff, it broke in here? And, you know, I told him, no, it didn't. But, but you know, things do go wrong. Uh, uh, I was talking to Emma about this because I guess she was in the library nearby. In 2003, this Renaissance statue of Adam came crashing to the floor. It was on a faulty pedestal. There was construction going on that I guess moved it a millimeter. Uh, in my, I had this good, good Morning America thing today, and we constantly were also hearing construction had to stop. A lot of construction at the Met. Um, but they repaired the thing. It took 12 years to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And this, believe it or not, is Adam after the fall, so to speak. Um, in my second year as a guard in 2010, a woman fell into the six foot tall painting called The Actor by Picasso, uh, making an almost six inch gash toward its bottom that had to be surgically repaired. Then speaking of Picasso, uh, not long after that accident, I was working um, in a special exhibition called Picasso at the Met. It was a blockbuster. You might not know that Met owns, you know, 250 odd Picassos. If you go to the modern wing right now, you're going to see six or seven. The rest is in storage or it's in 91st Street in the warehouse. The Met took everything out of storage and we were clicking in 1400 people an hour. And they're competing for space, trying to get closer and closer to the pictures. And it's our job to maintain that sort of narrow, empty channel that separates the cubist from the ordinary squares, if you know what I'm saying. And... I was doing that and somebody decided to take the inside track through the channel. And 
uh, he threw his shoulder into Picasso's woman in white right here, hard, like, like you know, a, a jock bowling over a freshman in the hallway. And it swung, you see how it's it's anchored up with those copper wires that go near to the ceiling. And it swung on those spaghetti thin copper wires. And it was like everyone held up their hands like this. And it was like there was an earthquake. The reality had sort of become unmoored as we were watching this pendulum Picasso. And then it went and we called the chief and the chief called the technicians. They looked at it. It was fine, but didn't feel fine for a while afterwards. I was buzzing. So this is all to say that there are dangers out there. And, you know, there may even be potential thieves in the building that we're watching out for. In the middle chapters of the book, as I'm becoming more sort of interested and involved with the fabric of the museum, its history and its operations and the people that are wandering through, I also take a brief detour to talk about what people are really interested in, and that is art heists. Um, so this ancient head of Hermes, there are many just like it. You know, it wasn't made by some famous artiste. It was made by a dirt under his fingernails artisan who worked outdoors next to his goats and probably knew Socrates, whose, you know, father was, was a, a stone carver. Um, ancient Athens was not so big. But this Hermes head is a little bit uh, interesting because it was stolen from the Met in 1979 and spent some time in a storage locker at Grand Central Terminal. Um, so that's sort of the tease, but let me give you a touch of the ancient history. Uh, Hermes was the winged foot messenger god. He traveled from our world to the world of the gods, which for the Greeks was the same world. I mean, the gods might be up on a mountain, but they are a part of our universe. They have form and shape the same way we do which is accounts for why Greek art is so vital. Even their ideas kind of can be seen, have form and shape. And Hermes is the idea of travel. He's the, he is the god of, of travelers. Um, it was actually Beth Goff who told me, you know, Mercury is on Grand Central Terminal where that um, Mercury is the same as Hermes, where this head ends up. Um, he also, though, as a traveler, he can transgress boundaries, transgress political boundaries, which made him the god of thieves. So let's, let's flash forward to 1979. Um, the King Tut exhibit was in town. Some of you probably went to the King Tut exhibit. And amidst the hoopla, a guard turned around and he noticed an empty pedestal. And they put out an APB. It was on the front page of the New York Times. This was February 10th. Now on February 14th, remember that date, same date my book comes out. On February 14th, 1979, a call comes in to curiously the security desk at 30 Rock. And they tell the security guards, hey, if you're looking for that Hermes head, you should look in storage locker 5514 at Grand Central Terminal. A couple of detectives from Midtown South go, they pry the thing open, they move an old bed sheet aside, and what do you know, they're looking in to Hermes's deathless eyes. But that is not the strange part of the story. The sound's made up, but it's true. Above Hermes's left eye, there had been a heart-shaped carving. The Met has buffered it since out. It was maybe centuries old. Maybe it wasn't even a carving. Maybe it was an accidental impression made when it fell on the floor or something. When it was recovered, there was a freshly carved matching heart above its right eye. So remember, this was Valentine's Day. So the old-timer guard who told me this story, and I checked on it. It's true. You see here. Um, his theory of the case was that a guy was wandering the Met. He was interested in Hermes. He noticed that heart. He said, hey, I don't have a gift for my girl for Valentine's Day. He swiped the thing, carved the other heart as sort of an extravagant gesture. She opened the box on Valentine's Day and said, what in the hell are you thinking? And they called in the tip themselves. That's often how it works. What prevents art from being stolen is us guys you know, standing there in blue suits. And these days it's cameras and alarms, but it's also once you have this stuff, how are you going to fence it, right? How are you going to move it? That was a bad stretch for them. That in 1980, a couple of teenagers, they noticed a flaw in the display case in the Egyptian wing. They went home, they got a clothes hanger. They came back, they knocked Ramses the sixth ring here onto a map that they had slid under. And they slid that map out and they took the ring, popped it in one of their mouths, walked out of the museum, walked straight to a jeweler on Lexington Avenue, said, hey, look what we got. 
The jeweler obviously knew that something was up, but rather than call the cops, he gave him five grand for it. And he called the Met and he said, hey, I've got your ring. And if you could scrape together $80,000, maybe it can find its way back to you. And the Met said, uh, you know, they called the cops and organized a sting and everyone was arrested. You know, that's that's probably not what you're going to do. And I'll give you just one more real quick. I promise you this is in the whole book, but it's fun. Um, it's a small part. Uh, in 1910, uh, you Gannic people might like to know, this Egyptian goddess found her way to a pawn shop on the Bowery. Um, it was stolen from the Met. The thief walked it down. And the New York Times reports on the colorful dialogue between him and the pawnbroker. They might have made it up, but this is what they say. He said, I have a bit of brass here that I'd like to raise some money on. And the pawn shop broker looked at this and he grunted and he said, well, what you call the workmanship may decrease the value of the brass for all I know. And he gave him 50 cents for it. And the thief sold his pawn ticket for an additional dime. And that was good enough, according to the detectives, to buy five whiskeys or 10 beers. And um, it was later found when the cops made their regular pawn shop rounds through the Bowery. At this time, by the way, a, uh, the Mets guards would, would have been armed um, with pistols. In fact, there was a shooting gallery in the Mets basement um, and they held annual shooting contests between the day guards and the night guards. And what you're seeing right here is the winning team. It was the night guards that year. And they would pass back and forth this um, trophy custom made by Tiffany and company. So that's all to say that there are dangers to look out for. But I can tell you, I was born in 1983. Hasn't been a single theft in my lifetime. Um, it's nice sort of working a job where you bat a thousand, right? You go home to the wife and she says, anything stolen today? And you say, nope, nope, nothing stolen today. Um, I can tell you too that, you know, I want to return again to a typical day and, you know, maybe I would be spending minutes here or there telling people don't touch or shushing people off their cell phones or, you know, telling a woman to put her tuna fish sandwich away, but there were still hours to just stand and lean and pace and wander and take in whatever happened to be going on around you. Um, that's my British cover on the right side, by the way. I want to make this point that, you know, a museum guard's job is very unique um, for the modern world because most people are busy. Most of us are busy. It's a guard's job not to be busy. A watchman's role is almost an old medieval one of just having your hands empty and your head up and making sure that all is well, not pushing any ball forward, not advancing any project. And in that stillness, there is incredible freedom of mind to just think in any direction you choose. And because you're, you're not tethered to a project that way and to look at the art and to look at the life that is swirling around the art. Uh, there was a veteran guard, an old timer, not so quite old, as old as this fellow, but an old timer who gave me this advice. He said, you know, when you get bored of the art, you watch the people. When you get bored of the people, you walk at the art. Um, I will tell you, though, in a strange way, I think I didn't often get bored, really, uh, because time works very differently when you have gobs and gobs of time. You know, if you've got 45 minutes to kill, that can feel interminable. If you've got 12 hours to kill, you know that you cannot kill it. So you have to make peace with it. You sort of have a truce. You know that each hour is going to feel exactly an hour long. And that ends up feeling very capacious. You can do a lot in those hours, especially if you're, you know, in good mental shape. You've had your coffee that day. You know, after all, I would be wandering. I would be, you know, spending one day in ancient Egypt and then the next day with Jackson Pollock. And maybe I'd end my week, you know, hanging out with some Congolese power figures. And as a guard, you're learning your way around this museum, you know, every, every inch of it. But you also have time to reckon with just how much you do not know. Um, you know, more so, I think, than a museum curator who spends most of their time thinking about things that they do know, sort of creating more and more sophisticated knowledge in an area where they are trying to be expert. Um, for as a guard, I never felt like an expert at anything because, you know, I was spending eight hours with this set of gods and then another eight hours with this set of gods. And frankly, I was never kind of tempted to be an expert in a narrow field because I felt like the unique thing I could do 
is sort of try and try and happily fail to wrap my mind around the whole place. And I think that that's what a lot of museum goers do. You go there and you bop around from thing to thing and you try to conceive of what this great big world is. And I think a lot of good comes from that effort. Um, this fellow right here, he's a 16th century Sufi, and he spent his time trying to have direct mystical experiences of and grapple with the infinite greatness of God. And he thought of this paradoxically, because on the one hand, he was never going to do it. He was never going to succeed at it. God is beyond all reckoning. But it was the practice, it was the attempt that made his life meaningful. And you do get these glimpses, you get these, these um, you know, glimmerings. And in an art museum, I think it's much the same way. Um, it isn't important to come to conclusions. No one can kind of sum all this up. But you can have experiences uh, because you come to face to face with these objects and by dint of their beauty or their delicacy or their profundity or whatever the case may be, they communicate something that is perhaps beyond words. And I put this up because the, the ancient Greeks, when they met a god face to face, they called that an epiphany. That's what that word is. And the Greeks thought they were having epiphanies a good deal. And that's what I think you and I are really after in an art museum, little epiphanies, you know, a little taste of Athena's, you know, greatly level and placid wisdom there on the left, or a little taste of enlightenment by looking at that 900-year-old Buddha on the right. And in all these different wings, too, I would get to people watch. And all the different places in the Met have atmospheres that are very distinct from one another. And I would watch people from you know five boroughs and 50 states and six continents uh, who are yield, who are fancy and not fancy, sophisticated and not sophisticated, sort of uh, look at me and see that I'm this guy wearing a, a, a suit, but sort of a broken down suit so that looks approachable to people. And they'd turn to each other and they'd say those magic words sometimes, hey, let's ask this guy. And they'd come up to me and they'd ask me questions. So, you know, they'd ask me for the Mona Lisa, they'd ask for the dinosaurs, they'd ask for, you know, if this is real, is that real? Really? That's real? And, you know, I'd get sophisticated questions too, of course, but it was often these bewildered people who started the best and most open conversations. Um, and I appreciated them because sometimes, of course, you show up to work, you know, when I was five years, six years on, and you might as well be working at the Dwayne Reed. You know, you're not thinking about this grandeur around you. And it took these people to sort of with their wide eyes to kind of widen your eyes. And I would tend to think, you know, they're right. They're right to feel all spun around inside of the Met because this place is so big along so many axes. And none of us, not the director of the Mets, not the curators, should feel kind of oriented in this place. It's, it's, it's kind of more or less impossible. So I'd have these conversations. Um, but the best conversations I had were with people who were wearing my same suit of clothes. And that, of course, is with my fellow guards. So this is the Mets Great Hall. Um, sometimes I would be assigned there to this wonderful post called Checkpoints. Um, and this meant that I was standing with a partner at one of the three entrances into the galleries from there, just making sure people were wearing their little tin entry pins. Remember those days? Uh, we all are sad that they're gone. Now they have non-union people booping in tickets. Not what you want. But it used to be that uh, it was just two of us standing on either side of a narrow entryway, making sure that people were wearing their color for the day. And what that meant in practice is I was having an eight or a 12 hour long conversation with a partner. And remember, there are over 500 guards. So these are, uh, you don't know nearly everybody. If you're working with some old timer, oftentimes you would hear their entire life story and they never ask you your name. They've done this a hundred times and that's just kind of who they are. Um, and I got very good at plying people with questions and I learned so much about so many different parts of the world and about the city. You know, 40% of New York City is foreign born. Um, I guess that about half the guards are foreign born. Uh, they're from really every country you can imagine, but there are also contingents. There are tons of Albanians. There are tons of Guyanese. 
um, the longest serving person in the security department. I call him Chief Singh in the book. He's in the middle there. Chief Singh, he's a security officer, or sorry, uh, Chief. He's, I think he's got 50 years now. Um, his son, Dr. Singh, is an obstetrician, and he delivered my children. So that's sort of the, the family that I ended up kind of making at the Met. Uh, a ton of guards are artists. Um, and indeed, here are two issues of Swipe magazine, which are entirely filled with art made by Metropolitan Museum of Art security guards. Um, I'll share briefly this wonderful quilt. This is made by Emily Lamacus, who's a star among us. Um, and she made this partly out of security department uniforms. She was inspired by the G's Ben quilts that are so beautiful in the modern wing. And that's a yellow infraction ticket, by the way, that she's folded into an air paper airplane. You get that when you're when you're late to work. Um, but the wonderful thing about the guards is that they are really everybody. You know, when I worked at, at the New Yorker, you know, almost all your colleagues, they've been to a school that's sort of like yours. Um, they read books that are kind of like the books that you read, and they followed a sort of straightforward path often to get to where they are um, in the publishing industry. Not always, but often. But hardly anyone follows a straight path to become a guard at a museum. Um, and the result is that the guard corps, you know, roughly resembles what you would find at a Queens bound train at rush hour. It's just everybody. When you look around and you're like, this is not only diversity in backgrounds and, you know, skin tones, it's also diversity in just styles of being, styles of thinking, way people carry themselves, way people think. And it, it's really not an exaggeration to say that the 500 men and women in dark blue suits is the most emblematic of the world part that this great world museum really, really has in its collection. Um, this is my good friend. Uh, I call him Joseph in the book. Um, I don't think he cares, but I'll stick with Joseph. That's him holding my, my one year. He's, there's my son, Oliver. He was one year old at the time. He's nine years old now. Uh, Joseph is from West Africa, and he just retired back in December. And I want to show you Joseph's favorite gallery at the Met, and you'll see why. Um, it's a scholar's garden from Ming Dynasty, China. And you enter it through this wonderful moon gate. The legend above the moon gate says, in search of quietude. And in the back left corner, uh, there's a sun gate. And above the sun gate, it says, elegant repose. And when I give tours, I like to end them here because the garden is a world in miniature in a similar way that the Met is a world in miniature that sort of gathers all of these, these um, different cultures under one roof. And I think we come to an art museum in search of quietude. And I think that I at least spent, you know, 10 years leaning on walls in elegant repose or like to think I did. This, by the way, is a guard mark. Once you start getting used to looking for these, that's that's from probably 100 plus years of guards leaning against that wall. Um, but I also found, you know, it's also a world in miniature in another sense, in that it's a place where I found community and fellowship with people like Joseph. That's him at his retirement dinner. And that went a long way in bringing me back into rhythm with the world and maybe not quite so speechless and shell-shocked as I was at sort of the beginning of this journey. And at this retirement dinner, Joseph is showing us pictures of a house he's building for himself in Ghana because he's going to retire there for half the year. And I say to him, Joseph, that's the moon gate. On the left, he is building in Ghana his own version of a Chinese scholar's garden that is in New York City. He's talking to a guy from Chicago about it in New York that he's building halfway across the world. And, you know, I think that that's the sort of thing that we as New Yorkers are very privileged to be a part of. And I was very privileged to be a part of at the Met. So, you know, the last chapters of my book are really about my journey kind of out of the Met. Um, I think when I started as a guard, I was, as I say, speechless and quiet. I sort of had intentionally fallen out of rhythm with sort of the ordinary world outside the Met's doors, which being a guard kind of allows you to do. Over the course of 10 years, though, you know, I changed quite a bit. I found sort of a new rhythm in conversations with museum goers and, you know, hey, pal, you know, where's where's uh, the Mona Lisa? I love that stuff. And also in this fellowship with the guards. And, um, you know, it helps me grow up. I was I was 25 years old when I started the Met. I was uh, 
oh, sorry, I was 35 years old and I had a wife and a couple of kids when I, I left in 2019. And I'd like to end this book talk with uh, just a little bit of practical advice uh, that I give at the end of the book. Um, advice how you might put a great art museum to good use. So this is an excerpt, it's brief. Um, and I'm at my last day and I'm kind of addressing in my own head the, the crowds that I see that are flowing up the grand staircase on my last day. See if I can give a good picture. I guess we'll do this. And I say, you know, you are now entering a world in miniature. It's terrain stretching from the mudflats of Mesopotamia to the cafes of Left Bank Paris and a thousand other places where humankind has really outdone itself. First, just get lost in the vastness of it all. Leave your meaner thoughts on the doorstep and try to feel pleasantly like a tiny insignificant speck afloat in a storehouse of beautiful things. Come in the morning, if you can, when the museum is quietest, and at first say nothing to anybody, not even a guard. Look at artworks with wide, patient, receptive eyes and give yourself time to discover their details as well as their overall presence, their wholeness. You may not have words to describe your sensations, but try to notice them anyway. Hopefully in the silence and the stillness, you'll experience something uncommon or unexpected. Learn everything you can about an object's maker, culture, and intended meaning, typically a humbling process. But at some point, you'll want to switch gears and throw in your own two cents. The Met is a place where, with your own eyes, you can see what fellow fallible human beings have made of the world that you yourself live in. You're qualified to weigh in on the biggest questions artworks raise. So under the cover of no one hearing your thoughts, think brave thoughts, searching thoughts, painful thoughts, and maybe foolish thoughts, not to arrive at right answers, but to better understand the human mind and heart as you put both to use. Find out what you love in the Met, what you learn from, and what you can use as fuel, and venture back into the world carrying something with you, something that doesn't quite fit quite easily into your mind, that weighs on you as you go forward and changes you a little bit. And that's it. Um, that's the talk. Again, thank you so much, um, everybody. Uh, I'm going to give uh, be a, a little bit bold here, and I'm going to say that you know if this sounds interesting and if you could imagine yourself ordering this book, it's a cool thing if you pre-order it. <laughs> this is something that I've learned th from in the process. It really helps a brother out if you pre-order a book because it helps it kind of make noise for the booksellers. It's av available everywhere, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookshop.org, your, your own um, you know, bookstore. Uh, I also read the audiobook if you find my voice sonorous. And, um, and then I'm going to come to the March meeting and you will all have your books that you pre-ordered or you know the ones that are of those of you who are interested. And I, of course, will be thrilled if you ask me to sign it. Um, and on my website, uh, you'll find about my tours that I do with the Bowery Boys and at Untap New York. And feel free to contact me. My contact information is there. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you. And I will turn it over. Thanks so much, guys. Well, thank you, Patrick. That was just fantastic. Um, I really was moved and um, thrilled to hear you speak. If you stop sharing your screen, unless you have oh, something sure. you need to show during no. the Q and A, just go to the um, yeah. You'll see the stop sharing, and then oops, there we go. Okay, okay. Cool. Yeah, I'm just watching. If you go into the chat, you'll just see the accolades coming in. Everyone, oh, good, good, good. Everyone enjoyed this so much. So, if so if anyone has questions, specific questions, you can drop them into the chat or into the Q&A. Yeah, Michael Dillinger just pre-ordered it. I'm going to be like, as soon as the meeting's over, I'm like, or maybe probably during one of the reports, I'll be pre-ordering it too. So um, that was really, that was just, just fantastic. Oh, thank and, you. Very kind. Um, yeah. And I love your um, comments about sort of finding that moment of, of silence, that moment when nobody is there. And you can sort of get in your head and, you know, guess uh, sort of mentally uh, set your day and maybe think about what you're going to be seeing next. And um, uh, my question is, did you, were you, are you ever able to, were you ever able to request a gallery to be stationed in? You can, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to use that card too often. 
the dispatch office doesn't want you doing that that often say oh could you please send me the old masters today um some of the old timers who are characters they can get by with anything so they're yeah. going to be in their galleries they want to be all the time but most of us know you're just at the whim right right and um as you mentioned, the the Met Guards are unionized, and we had a question about that. Um, yeah, th there is I, there is the union there. Um, if you want to speak a little bit about that, about how the unions work at the Met, I think that's interesting because not just the guards, you've got riggers and lampers and everybody. Um, yeah, so that's right. They're all part of DC thirty seven, which is the municipal union. It, it's sort of a funny thing, the Met, because it's kind of part a city thing and then part the board of trustees the city owns the building the board of trustees own the art but i guess the city gives a chunk of money over for the maintenance of the building and the security budget is kind of paid for by the city so we're part of the municipal union and like emma said yeah it's not just the guards it's also a bunch of kind of technicians and technical kind of departments yeah yeah because and um custodians. Yeah, the custodians, the um, the basically the people who are wearing uniforms tend to be unionized, and those who don't are not union, except for some of the technicians. Um, for example, I, I I'm still a volunteer at the library, so the library um, people who are working behind the desk, the library, some of those are in the union, but not the librarian themselves. So it's kind of yeah. an interesting thing. I hope that helps answer. Um, um, you know. This answers your question, Lee, and Lee Hallenby asked that. Um, so a question from Beth, from Beth, one of our um, board members. Um, did you did you ever like keep a little bit of paper or something you could jot down your thoughts while you were there? Or did you just sort of hold on to them until you were on your break and you could put- I did. I mean, it's actually funny. I feel like had it been 15 years prior, if a chief saw you writing, they would probably yell at you. But in the cell phone era, they really just don't want you on your cell phone. So if you're just writing in a little analog reporter's notebook, that just seems quaint. And they're <laughs> mostly not going to yell at you, which was wonderful for me because that's what I like to do. But yeah, you can't sit there and write a novel, but I would certainly right. be making uh, notes to myself. Yeah. And and I know the artists, the, the guards who are artists. I mean, I remember that when I was working there full time, the ones who would be sketching and just talking to them early in the morning as they're just you know, drawing, like you said, that little analog thing. So yeah, you're not on your phone, but you're, you're yes. doing something that's not. Exactly. Um, Similar like, things. They're, they're not going to want to sit there and, you know, do a whole Rembrandt, but yes, they can do a little sketching. So great question. How did the guy get that Hermes head out of the museum without anyone noticing carrying this big object? Nobody knows. I mean, it was at a time before cameras and, uh, it was, like I said, the King Tut exhibit was in town and he probably just noticed that a guard was otherwise occupied and he put the thing into a shopping bag is my guess. Um, I, you know, nowadays they mostly have things more secured, but apparently they didn't. Right. And um, oh, this is great. And do you know if the guards had any thoughts about the tours that were going on? A lot of us give group tours there and are the guards suddenly, oh, my God, here comes this person or here comes that person. You know, do you have any stories about that? And don't sure. the tour guides, but just yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're respectful, of course, everyone is is gonna dig you. Um, the the museum hack was not always the most most uh, respectful organization, so there was a lot of eye rolling about them. But I think they're gone. Yeah. Um, so. One interesting thing at the Met is the the most tours come in through uh, the the biggest group is the Jehovah's Witnesses. They bring yeah. just hundreds of people, but they are very very polite. Um, but it's always funny when they're leading tours because, you know, we all know that people will agglomerate onto your tour sometimes. And it's funny when that happens with their tours because it takes the people a minute to realize there's something a little funky about this tour. It's it's not just, you know, the earth, the earth is only 6,000 years old in this tour. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, mostly I, I think guards have a fine relationship with guides. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me see, I'm just looking through the... Um... Yeah, yeah. Kevin's comment. If you ever want to see how disinformation works, take the Jehovah's Witness tour. It's it's interesting. I've been in the Egyptian galleries and listening to that tour, and I'm just I'm trying to control my face not to just blurt out, go, what? So yeah, it's really it's really crazy. Um, so I I have a question. So you said that you were there till 2019. Did you leave just before COVID or were you, were you, did you, you know, are, are you, did you just get tired of being guard and say 10 years, I'm done kind of thing? 
I felt kind of ready. Um, the sort of inside baseball of it, which I, I don't go into in the book too, because you don't want to get too meta, is that I also at that point, it seemed possible that the book would happen. I had a literary agent and it looked like there was some traction. So I needed more time to to work on it, to write the proposal and things. So that that played a role. But I also, yeah, I just, I for all the reasons I, I kind of talk about, I kind of felt like I had... I had grown in a certain way that made me feel like that chapter was maybe closed and I might want to try something new. So when did you decide to write a book about your experience? I would say kind of six or seven years in. I, I mean, I've always written. So six or seven years in, I think I had the idea like, man, this should be a book. Um, but my first thought was a guard's guide to the Met. At first, I thought, of you know, sort of like a guidebook where you bop around from thing to thing and it's sort of a... a um, a more, you know, offbeat perspective. But then I realized, you know, the world has enough sort of offbeat guidebooks. Uh, I, I, I thought it would be different to tell a story. And I think the way to, there are very few books that are written about the experience of looking at art and kind of what that feels like. And I think there's no way for me to write a book that delves into that without also explaining who I am and sort of telling this story and then also trying to tell the story of the guards and the institution sort of through it. And speaking of guards, where is the shooting trophy? Oh, man, that's a fascinating question. I never thought of that. That is a fascinating question. It's got to be somewhere, right? It's actually on Monday, there's going to be a Talk of the Town article in the New Yorker about me. And they fact-checked this, this issue about whether there really was a silver trophy by Tiffany and company. So I had to, I had to look up the, I had to find that that was a real thing. But where it resides right now, that's a very good question. I'm going to try to pursue that. I'm going to say, I bet you it's somewhere in American decorative arts. Yeah, I wonder. You know, I wonder, yeah, if, if, I wonder it's, if it's. I wonder if it's in the it, loose. It could be. It could be in the loose center. I know that never occurred to me, but I, I should. I should go haunting. Yeah, that would yeah. be really, really cool to know. So, do you have another book or another project in the works? Depends how this one does. <laughs> you know, like if this one does well, uh, I do kind of have an idea of. You know, this book is very narrative, so it's not a ton of, you know, pictures or reproductions or things like that. And I do have an idea for a book that would be, you know, a little more coffee table-y, a little more reproduction heavy, um, it's kind of about looking at art where they're actually looking at the painting sort of with me. But that would all be dependent on how this does. So I I frankly have no idea what the next couple of years of my life will be. I really have no idea. So we'll see. Well, I think, I mean, tonight's audience, I think we can all say it's going to be a fantastic success. Oh, well, thanks. And just, just going by your blurbs, I mean, you've got the best blurbs from Alec Ross to Keith Christensen. I mean, Keith's a god. So that's, that's and oh, cool. Eric, Eric James Marshall, I mean, please. So yeah, I think, yeah. yeah, you've got a very strong um, thumbs up from some very important people. And I can tell you, the, the guides here, I, saw, I can't wait to read it. I can't wait to read it. Um, and I'm really, really looking forward to to hearing more and going on one of your tours. I've got to go on one of your tours. I, sure, love that. Yeah, and, and then we'll go underneath. We'll go through the tunnel together. And <laughs> yeah, and everybody yeah, yeah. loves that. You know, when you take people to the Met and you take them underneath, you get to that art yield to art in transit. That's the coolest. I think that's one of the coolest signs ever. Yes. Yeah. The, the the Met in the shooting today with ABC, they let us go downstairs and they, which I would have never guessed that they would have done that 10 years ago. And Jonathan said it'll be on right before um, the publication. That's actually turns out not to be true. It'll be later. Unfortunately, it's going to be kind of toward the end of the month. I don't quite know exactly when, um, but probably around February 26th, but um, we'll see. Let us know as like as soon as you know you have to tell us and all of okay, us cool. you know in the olden days we would set our VCRs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna gonna keep looking for it. So thank you so much, bravissimo. That was just that was a lot of fun and really very very moving. And so thank you oh, for thank sharing you. with us in such a in such a wonderful personal way. So what I'm going to do, Patrick, and it's it's a little unceremonious, but I'm going to make you an attendee. Kick me out. I'm just gonna disappear off the screen so you can go get some, you know, you can stay at the meeting. You can leave the meeting um, if you if you if you'd like. But again, thank you, thank you so much for this. And actually, you'll see this um, this meeting is recorded and it will be posted onto the Gannick YouTube channel, so you can watch what you said or not. I sometimes wonderful. 
Um, well, not everyone wants to do that. So thank you again. Thank you again. And all right. Thank you very much, you everybody. Meeting, bring your Sharpies to sign. Okay. All right. So now, okay. Ah, oh, that was great. I'm just, I'm really excited. I can't wait to, can't wait to read it. So now we're going to move to the NFTGA um, reports. This is um, Jared Goldstein, um, Mark Landman, and myself. We all went to San Antonio, Texas last week for the National Federation of Tourist Guides Association's um, biennial meeting. Um, the um, it was organized by the Professional Tour Guide Association of San Antonio. They've got like one of the longest letter set of names. Um, and they did an amazing job. Just uh, we'll get into the panels, and, um, but just to, it was really, it was really a lot of fun. I think we had 12 or, or maybe 14 GANIC members were there. A lot came with their spouses. A lot stayed for pre-tour and um, pre-conference and post-conference. And we had a wonderful time and they really organized it very well. The, all the panels were very interesting. And then we did some great tours and a lot of really good food. And so it was a lot of fun. Um, so if you are, you know, when the next um, conference comes up and you want to go, definitely, I highly recommend it. Um, it was, it was a really, it was a great time. Great times had by all. So I'm going to be reporting on two sessions um, and we basically have 10 minutes each. And um, I'd also be happy to take some Q and A. The, um, I was at the delegates meeting and that's really the, going to be the meat of my presentation is talk about the delegates meeting, which is um, the presidents of the various member associations of the NFTGA uh, met along with some of them brought seconds, some of them brought delegates with them. Mark Landman um, participated on behalf of GANIC, so it was myself and Mark at the delegates meeting um, run by Michael Dillinger, GANIC member who also NFTGA president. Um, it's the, because of COVID, because of skipping San Antonio, which was supposed to be last year, everything has been shifted. And so in, board, in order to bring the board, the boards are typically elected at the conferences. And so to bring the board elections into alignment with the new conference schedule, the delegates at that meeting approved the current board on um, to be extended until 2025, because the next um, in-person conference will be in 2025. The board still has one position open, another position as director at large. Um, so if anyone on GANIC would like to participate at a higher level to, to join NFTGA, to um, put yourself forward as a um, member of the NFTGA board, it's really a great group of people. The um, there's Jim Carr from, from DC is on the board, you have Jerry Perkins from Las Vegas, Janie Cadena from um, San Antonio, um, Carrie Belisle from uh, San Diego, and then Carolyn, I'm blanking on her last name, who's the treasurer from DC. So it's a nice mix of people. Um, they do great stuff. They have a board meeting once a month, and then they have the leadership meeting um, also once a month. So it'd be two meetings, and then depending on what um, Michael Dillinger wants to assign to you to do, um, but it's a fun, fun thing to do. Um, yes, and Michael says you can email him directly if you have any questions, and Michael will put his um, NFTGA email into um, into the chat. Um, to, so if you put that in the chat to everyone, that would be great, Michael. Thank you. Uh, we are doing monthly leadership meetings. These are at eight thirty p.m. Um, Eastern time on the second Thursday of every month. Um, Yes. Oh, Michael, you have to send that to everyone. You sent it just to hosts and panelists. So pre it's president at nftga.com. But um, the the leadership meetings, I typically attend that with one with a board member. And we will have minutes from that. That's when um, the, uh, there we are, president at nftga.com. That's when the respective associations can update other associations on what they're doing, but it's also time to discuss um, NFTGA business. And they're really going to be business meetings, but I'm also always happy to share with you any, any discussion that takes place at those meetings. One thing that Michael did stress was Destination Capitol Hill. Um, NFTGA is trying to get more members to attend, not just New York and DC. DC is easy because they're right there. New York's easy to get to as well, but to make sure we have other tour guides 
representing their different states at um, Destination Capitol Hill, which is the lobbying event for the US Travel Association. And so this is something that we'll be discussing also at the next leadership meeting. So we're typically have very good representation there for New York and New Jersey. Harvey often goes for New Jersey. Um, so um, it'd be, so we're trying to get people coming from different parts of the country. Um, one thing is there's anything you want to bring up at the leadership meeting sort of on a bigger scale than just GANIC? Let me know, and I'll bring that to the NFTGA meeting. We now have travel and tourism um, as an assistant cabinet level position, I believe it is, and things are sort of changing more at a at a higher federal level. And so, if anybody has questions about that or wants any of that brought up, just let me know. Um, you can always email me or email the board. Um, it's always board at um, Gannick.org, pre, uh, president at Gannick.org. So you can let me know and I'm happy to bring up um, issues to the NFTGA and to the association um, members, so the leaders. So that would be, um, that's fine. And I'd be ha very happy to do that. They too are looking at redesigning the NFTGA website. And they want to know if anyone in the association, um, in the uh, member associations, has ideas for the website. I have very strong ideas for the website, but I'm doing our website. So that's taking up my time. But if anyone on the um, in the general membership has ideas or thoughts about the NFTGA website, um, just let us know. Now, last but not least, the um, location of the next conference is to be determined. It was sort of thrown out there. And Michael said, he's like, so who wants to host the next one? And everybody sort of sat and looked at him. So um, that's something that is still to be determined. If New York wants to do it, we got to get our butts in gear. And that's a big thing to plan, of course, a meeting. Uh, the, and New York is, you know, one of the most expensive locations. New York and DC are probably the more expensive ones. Um, the past meetings, uh, so it was just at San Antonio. The one before that was Charleston. The one before that was Philadelphia. I think the one before that was DC. So I have a feeling they're going to be looking at the West Coast, which would be really great um, to have a little more West Coast re representation. Um, yeah, John, Sam like makes we could we could have it in Jersey, just right across the river. But um, then every then all you guys would complain. Yeah, I see Jared's horrified expression. Um, you get the bends when you cross the Hudson. So um, yeah, so I think they're going to be looking at the West Coast, but we'll of course we'll keep you tuned. Um, and keep you uh, updated on that. So there were, um, so there were, um, so that's really it from the delegates meeting. Any questions about the delegates meeting? If you have any, please put that in chat and I'll address them um, after I've given the next section because the other um, presentation uh, that I'm supposed to speak about is uh, Mitch Bach. He did a wonderful um, presentation about tour guides and technology. And he sort of gave us a humongous list of all the stuff. And then it's like, what do you guys want to talk about? And so different um, different things came up. And the, 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 the great thing is, um, you know, Mitch is very, very um, generous with his time, very, very generous with his knowledge. And he has a lot of great information. And the thing that I like the best, actually, the thing that I really like the best of one, he gave all sorts of tips about um, about using technology on the bus, how to hook up your um, your telephone to the bus video system so you can show things with HDMI cables and adapters and stuff like that. But what I really liked for those multi-day tours, not all of us do those, but I think this could be a fun thing for your student tours, was he said, take just a couple seconds of video every single day and then stitch them together into a little film, iMovie, or I forgot what it's called. I think it's like called Reels or something, not Reels, it has another name for Androids. But you make a little video, just you know, a couple minutes long, and then you can um, share it with your um, with your guests on your tour. It's a really nice little, a little sort of gift, a little parking, parting gift um, when they end with a tour. And one thing he, um, he just sort of showed in real time was different ways of sharing information whether using um, you know, Google Drive, uh, of course, is always an option, but of making how to make little mini, very quick websites of how to do that. And his information and detail, detail information is available through Trip School. So if you check out the Trip School website, um, it's hard just to you know, explain um, in an off the cuff kind of quick way 
like this. So, um, and I'm trying to be very careful of the time because of Jared and um, and Mark has to present too. So I'm going to keep an eye on chat, see if there are any questions there. I'll answer them in the chat or answer them live. But let's have Jared now speak about the, um, the sessions that he's going to cover for us. And there were five sessions total. So I got one and the delegates meeting and they have, the gentlemen have two each. So go ahead, Jared. Thank you for your support, Gannick. Uh, this is my seventh conference between NFTGA and the IATDG. This is my first one with a stipend. And so I want to share my notes with uh, this group right now, but also with Facebook and the newsletter if they want it. And maybe uh, Gannick documents will host, uh, will host my notes too, because I want to uh, make it worthwhile for your, uh, for your membership dollars. I'm reporting on marketing, which was day three, session two, with Judith Jackson from the American Marketing Association and Ellen Malaski from the Washington DC. She was a, a, she's a Washington DC tour guide and past uh, NFTGA president. Um, themes include the digital world and differentiation, finding your market, content, social media, and uh, descriptions, networking, online booking, and billing and pricing yourself accordingly. And so um, I, want, I, I may not be able to cover all of this. So uh, that's why I'm happy to share my notes with you. The, uh, so the, this was not necessarily in time order. I created the themes. So in the digital world, mobile is the entry point, like mobile phones but transactions happen most often on desktop computers. Reviews help search engine optimization known as SEO, which means higher rankings on search pages like Google and Bing. Keep in mind that reviews last forever and they are important. Uh, major reviewing sites include TripAdvisor, Yelp, Google. Respond to reviews and online queries and don't offer a free tour to a bad reviewer, just tell them to contact you and put that in your review. See if, uh, see if the review breaks guidelines. If so, you can get that bad review down. Now, I once heard that if you get, it's important to get the bad review down before replying to it, because that sticks it on, to, that, that, that keeps it on the site. But if it's a phony review, maybe you can get that pulled down first. If you can't get it pulled down, then respond to it. Lots of reviews in one day can be a red flag. So don't get your employees to review your business. Another thing to do is see how you look online. If you search for yourself on Google, um, Google's going to uh, make you, uh, is going to, is, is, has already customized your search. So you need to search for yourself in incognito mode, uh, which means that Google is not uh, recognizing you and giving you a more objective uh, search response. Hashtags, that's the pound symbol. Um, if you uh, use hashtags in social media, uh, before using them, see where they take you, like maybe to your competitors or something controversial that you hadn't thought of. Best days to market yourself, such as on social media, are Monday, Sunday, and Tuesday. Another uh, tip is put the Q a QR code on your business card, and your website should have testimonials. If you want to improve your website's SEO, take a look at something called Yoast.com. It's like Roast, Y-O-A-S-T.com will examine your, your website's SEO. On to differentiation. Be memorable, relevant in your promotions and postings. Compare these business names. For example, Jackson Travel Agency versus Trips to Remember. So one of those is, a, is considered a better name for a business. Spell out your benefits to your customers. And in the post-COVID world, this is our chance to shine. People aspire to escape. You also want to ask, answer some questions. What is my passion? Why am I a guide? What do I do well? What am I number one at? What do I like? Tell your story and show where your, show where your value is to the customer. And specialize. On to finding your market. Think, how would they search for me? Who do I want to reach? What do they want to buy? 
where are my customers located or from? Core operators uh, that you might want to market to want to know that adults will have fun and include a story about it. How did you add to an itinerary? And how did you deal with the unexpected? Fill in this blank. Kids will something on your tours. Kids will what on your tours? They should be able to identify with historical figures like George Washington when he was young. And kill, or, or kids will like me. So uh, keep in mind that student tour operators recruit in the fall. On to content. Be the expert, such as covering trends or things like five mistakes to avoid could be on your website, maybe on your uh, social media. Highlight unusual experiences and tours and have them think, I never knew that that is available. Use the web and email to capture and engage customers. Follow up, but don't harass them. Add value. Millennials, they want information, but they don't ask for it. But they do want relevant information and they also want experiences. Millennials want to discover what others haven't. And post things on your website like, did you know? And uh, Instagram or IG or Gram or Insta, you might want to promise having some good moments like that. You so, use, use appropriate language for different demographics. And one more tip, video is two times more effective than static content. It should be 15 to 20 seconds with cool captions. And there's uh, more to say about social media and also descriptions of, of your tours, networking, uh, joining associations, attending or organizing jobs fairs. There's a number of great associations and, uh, and resources out there that I'll list. And uh, also um, online booking sites like TripAdvisor and Viator, tours by locals, travel curious, get your guide, bespoke travel and context travel, and bill or price yourself accordingly. They say that failure comes from bad marketing plus bad management, set aside from marketing, like at the same time every Friday, invest in yourself. And on to the next topic. So there is more, I hope uh, you'll, you'll read up. Um, good practices or best practices for tour guides. This was the, uh, the concluding uh, panel and it had Emma Guest Gonzalez, our, our president, Michael Dillinger, our former president and president of the National Association, and Jerry Perkins of the NFTGA board of the Las Vegas shop, chapter. You wanna get in, and uh, first of all, I do wanna to apologize to the, to the panelists. I'm not quoting everybody. Um, I'm just trying to do this for expediency. So uh, strangle me later. Mindset, it is not my tour, it is their journey. Get into the guests' heads and hearts. It is not about what I know not recitation. Preparation starts the day before. Even things like the weather and how things along the route have changed. If you are visiting an observation deck on a zero visibility day, try to do something else and reschedule. And if not, emphasize their exhibits. Ask group sales for help. In advance helps. Know your audience. Where are they from? Who are they? Foster your respect and kindness. Build relationships with guests drivers and vendors, and be respectful and calm. Then we moved on to the topic of employment terms. What is your cancellation policy? Spell it out and make it clear. What else do the, do the, does your client want or expect? Otherwise, they'll probably surprise you. They may want you to pick up and return equipment on your own time, for example. Invoicing and payment deadlines. Try to get prepaid two weeks in advance. And our vendors should treat us with the respect that they pay to their other vendors like hotels, restaurants, and theater. Otherwise, we can be an afterthought. And something to look at is the nftga.com website. They have a sample contract. Another aspect of good, uh, of good practices is business, bookkeeping, QuickBooks, bank financial programs, keeping track. And have a company name and a business checking account. Think of it as tourism is our business. We do it for money, not just for love or fun. 
And what we do goes beyond the tour. Time is our commodity. And pay yourself for retirement or living a dignified life. Save money. Also, when negotiating with, with the client, sometimes they want to hire you for a day. Define what a day is. Is it four hours or 14 hours? Our overhead, different topic, our overhead should be considered. We all have it. A home office's overhead includes your rising rent. Are you charging what you charged 15 years ago? Is your rent the same as it was 15 years ago? What is our value to a tour operator? Let's say you're doing a tour for 50 kids and they're paying $8 per kid for a tour and you get paid $400. Well, this is much less than the cost of two, two movies or a museum for each of these kids. One issue that came up is that some guides are retirees doing guiding for fun or a little extra money, but some of us are trying to make a career now. We hope that everyone keeps that in mind. But there are reasons to charge less at times. Sometimes we do barter, maybe uh, back to the marketing discussion. Sometimes people market with SEO uh, uh, consultants and maybe they'll get free tour or travel planning. Another reason to charge less, volume. Maybe you're working with a client that gives you a lot of work, uh, reliable work. Maybe you're doing something for nonprofits, um, or maybe you're getting trained is another reason to charge less. Resources, as I mentioned, nftga.com has a section with guide resources with the business of guiding by Judith Smith, and they have other info. Mitch Bach also has a, has a publication called What Makes a Great Tour Director? And in conclusion, I know I'm going a little over, so the COVID world made us flexible and resilient and creative. So think of this new world as a challenge to embrace. Stay in the profession. There are shortages of guides and tour directors, and we have the opportunity to reinvent the industry, aspire to inspire. Thank you, Gannick. Great, thank you very much, Jared. And yes, everything, all of these reports will go into the documentation. So into, I'm sorry, the Gannick documents because we post our minutes and these will be included in the minutes. So Jared, as soon as you send it to the final one version to Patrick, um, he'll make sure it's all together and they all get published all at once. Um, on the Gannick website. So everyone will be able to um, refer to it. So Mark, and we're a little tight with time, but actually I think we'll be okay because I can tell you the IT report is gonna be super short and so is newsletter. So Mark, you're up. Oh, and you're muted. Okay. Uh, thank you to Gannick for selecting me as one of your delegates to the 2023 NFPGA in San Antonio. I'd like to start by acknowledging Harvey Davidson, who's gone to these conferences by himself for years. He, more than anyone else, has blazed the path to our seat at the table. This conference, 14 Gannick members attended, an impressive amount. On uh, Thursday, the introduction meeting was at 8.30 in the morning. An introduction by the pro president pro tem of the San Antonio City Council, and later a talk by a member of the City Council, Dr. Adriana Roja Garcia from the uh, City Council District Number Four, who all talked to us, and they spoke well for all of us. The opening speaker was Ellen Malaski, the past NFTGA president, who talked about the WFTGA discuss local culture and also training for guides. He spoke about the advantage of having a virtual conference. More people from more places can attend that way. ITGA is coming up, the International Tour Guide Day on February 21st, three weeks. And also the, the WFTGA conference in 2024 will be held in Sicily. Our own Michael Dillinger is a new NFTGA president is, of course, a Gannett member and our ex president. We thank the old and the new board members. Next was our host from San Antonio, the co chairs, Janie and Denise. They went to extraordinary lengths to plan this conference. The work was appreciated. Everyone agreed it was a great conference. They asked that we use hashtag NFTGA2023 in our social media posts. 
The morning conference was started off by Mark Anderson from Visit San Antonio, originally from Chicago. He spoke about his vision for San Diego, business, growth, and the culinary experience. He spoke extensively about the importance of historical preservation. This city has a very active historical preservation society. The list of safe buildings is impressive. Number one, storytelling. That's marketing. For Instagram, follow at Visit San Diego. Global development. That's two. We and they all want visitors from all over the USA and, over, and overseas. Three, diversity, equity, and inclusion. He suggested reaching out to others in the field to become guides and to join our local guides association. A good example, if you're at a, uh, you know, let's say a host at a conference, if you have a card, hand it out to others who aren't guides and encourage them that they're in the industry to become uh, tour guides like us. He'd also like to see, as we all would, travel, tourism, and hospitality as an honored career choice in the USA, as it is in Europe and Asia. The afternoon conference dealt with sustainable tourism. Jim Carr, the DC Guild President and Gannick member, and Dr. Virantra KC, who's from Nepal, a professor at Northern Texas University with a PhD in travel and tourism from North Carolina State University. He talked on sustainable, on sustainable tourism as defined by the United Nations. Topic of tourism in the 2030s. That agenda coming via organizations such as UNWTO.org, that's the United Nations World Tourism Organization, the National Geographic Society, and our own EPA. The, the pillars of sustainable tourism include economics, social and cultural differences. An example was given about a cultural dance that used to be done on important days. Now it's done daily for tourists, the environment. Sustainable versus ecotourism. Examples were given on the status of the Australian Great Barrier Reef environmental concerns about its future has caused changes in how they handle visiting tourists. Some places now ban sunscreen because of litter. Other examples, wildlife tourism, creating a connection with animals, movie and TV tourism, Braveheart created incredible business for that part of, of England. HGTV does the same thing with people fixing up homes. Agritourism, which would include pumpkin and apple food. food tourism. An example was given is Thai food losing its authenticity because of food tourism. They discussed food waste as a problem. But one of the good examples that they that they gave of being hopeful that in Denmark they give free kayak rides if you pick up trash in the sea. Next was Maria Garita from the Costa Rica Tourism Organization. She is responsible for, for sustainable tourism in Costa Rica. Also discussed with a tour guide code of conduct, having responsible travelers, and as Harvey Davidson mentioned, responsible tourism should be included within sustainable tourism. Thank you. I did keep it short. Thank you very much. Any questions? Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, much, Mark. And thank you again, Jared. Yes, if anyone has questions, please put them into the chat. You can address them to everyone or address them just to hosts and panelists. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sorry, visit happy. San Antonio. Sorry. Yeah. Did I say visit <laughs> we, San Diego? Yeah, we, we, we know what you meant. I think that's wishful thinking. And we'd like, I wouldn't mind going to San Diego for the next one. So, yeah. So thank you. Yeah. And like, um, like we said, these will all be posted. So if there are no questions, without further ado, we will continue. And so I'm going to um, make our next, okay, here we are. So Matt Baker will be speaking on behalf of the awards committee and Matt, I'm just promoting you to panelists. So you'll be popping up in screen on the screen in just a moment. 
So since we've seen Matt, we'll start with that. Oh, there we are. So go ahead, Matt, whenever you're ready. There we go. Ah, oh, technology will kill us. All right. Okay. Thank you, Emma. Uh, so tickets to the awards gala are now on sale. Uh, the link for buying the tickets is on the front page of the Gannick website and also went out in an email blast earlier today. Uh, and I'll see if we can get it put on the Gannick Facebook page and the members only group later tonight as well. GANIC members, when buying tickets, can use the promotional code GUIDE1 in capital letters for a membership discount, and our industry partners can use the code GANICIP, all caps, uh, for their partnership uh, discount. Uh, voting will end at midnight tonight. Just like Cinderella at the stroke of 12, I will push the button that stops voting uh, from the uh, form from accepting uh, responses, that final e email blast with the link went out earlier today. Uh, I want to apologize to some people who I know tried to vote right away when that was sent. Um, I accidentally closed the form, you know, right then and there. My finger slipped and whatnot, and when I saw that the link didn't work, I went and fixed it, so it should be fine. Uh, so until midnight tonight. Uh, we already have our best voter turnout ever so far, but it would be really, really great to get it even higher. I can tell you, uh, I'm not going to tell you what category, but I've been watching the responses. One of our categories currently has a tie. So don't think that your vote doesn't matter because that tie could be broken before midnight tonight. So do vote if you haven't. You have a few hours. Um, presenter hunt is going pretty well uh, for outstanding achievements in culture. Uh, the Broadway producers, Mia Moravis and Fred Rohan Vargas, have committed to presenting. Uh, for preservation, uh, Michael and Holly Zerbino from Archographica. It's an amazing graphics company that has done like historic signage for um, historic districts downtown and things like that. Their, their work is everywhere and you don't even know it. The little plaque for the back of uh, um, Trinity Church with the little arches uh, that we've all walked by a million times, that's an Archographica product. So they're they're wonderful people. They're going to do preservation for us. Um, for outstanding tourism, of course, we always go to Gannick members. And two of our favorite uh, you know, communities, of course, are our uh, Chinese and Italian neighbors. We have Yoi Wang and uh, Laura Caparati uh, presenting tourism. Thank you both so much. Um, for food, the uh, owners of the Cafe at Liberty and Ellis Islands, Brad and Yasmina Hill, they're two-time nominees. They've never won. They're going to present in food. Uh, for website, our very own Esther Train of Ephemeral New York. Uh, for social media, Charlene City and Maureen Steinert, uh, two great Instagrammers of the city, are going to be uh, presenting social media. Our very own Joseph Landon, uh, Jojo Landon, is going to do the In Memoriam. Thank you, Joe. Uh, and for Guiding Spirit, uh, Patrick Casey and Riley Kellogg will be uh, inducting um, Susan Birnbaum into that wonderful club. Uh, we are still finagling. I'm waiting for some confirmations for the presenters in book writing, journalism, and radio, uh, and photography. Uh, so I'm hoping for some confirmations from the people I've reached out to pretty soon. But if you know people who are prominent in book writing, journalism, radio, and photography, please get in touch with me, and I'll put them on the list in case too many people say no. I know you have people who say no for scheduling conflicts and anything else along those lines all the time. Um, so. I would much rather know who you think we can, you know, successfully reach and not need to than the other way around. And that is all I have for tonight. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Matt, it was a little muffled when you said the codes for the discounts. Sure. Uh, let me say that again. Or can you type them into the chat? That would be great, too. Oh, sure. I can do that. Um, um, how, how's my sound right now? It's 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 still a little muffled, but it's a little um go go. But if you just repeat it again, that'd be great. Okay, guide one for the membership code, and Gannick IP for the industry partner code, and I'll put that in the chat too. Okay, oh, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah. So everyone, make sure you vote. President, uh, can we count on you to open the show for us as usual? Why not? <laughs> 
I haven't actually gotten you in touch with you about it yet because I've been. I, I figure you were a fairly safe bet, and I wanted to get the people who were like, "What the hell is Gannis?" <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. Thanks so much. Great. Thank, you. Thank you, Matt. So I'm going to bring our next. Um, I'm going to bring our next presenter on. So we're going to have a report from Nina uh, for the Education Committee, and Matt, I will bring you back down to. Um, to an attendee. Okay, so Nina, you should be all set. Okay, here I am. Okay, yeah. great. I'll I'll skip to uh, also you know we always thank our guest speaker Patrick Bringley. Thank you so much for speaking tonight, and Emma for moderating, and Jonathan for introducing. And um, a special thanks to um, Janie Cardina, uh, co-chair of the NFTGA for inviting GANIC uh, Education Committee to join Washington DC Guild and San Francisco. Uh, I think tables were set up at lunch. I don't know how much the traffic was, but this is a beginning of a good idea. And uh, Susan Birnbaum and Bob Gelber of Education held the floor and uh, talked about, you know, ready to talk about certification and education. And Bob said, what we need to do is have a panel discussion next NFTGA meeting of, of all education committees of all the associations, that'd be great. Uh, March's meeting speaker so far is Kathy Reynolds uh, on, on Off-Broadway. There may be a panel, and Ellen Ro Eileen Rock has been working on this for about a year, this, this, this contact with the Theater Center at Times Square. So stay tuned for the March meeting, should be exciting. In the works, we always say TBA, I know that we're working on a stress reduction for tour guides. At some, at some point, it's going to come to fruition, and Emma Guest Gonzalez and the GANIC board all working on that. And upcoming events, uh, February 17th, Black History Month tour of the United Nations, Bob Gelber Industry Relations Education, uh, working on that. And uh, that's going to be uh, February 17th, February 24th, general tour of the United Nations, Bob Gelber, who's on, who wears two hats. Uh, he's an industry relations and longtime member of education, working on that. And um, March 4th, Stakes Day at the Big A, Thoroughbred Racing and Aqueduct racetrack with Robin Gar, who loves horses, and this should be phenomenal. And March 25th, a gigantic tradition started by the late Lee Gelber uh, was the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire Memorial Tour, and this is being carried on by Robin Gar. So uh, if you've never taken this tour, this is an amazing tour. Robin is really pull out the stops and that's going to be March 25th. And of course, the Education uh, Committee Corps meets the third Thursday every month on Zoom at 6 p.m. And the next meeting should be February 15th at 6 p.m. That's a, a, a Wednesday. And, and again, as Emma said, you know, if you, these these FAMs are in person, but we have a whole library of virtual FAMs. So you can curl up on a cold winter day, go to the website, um, listen to some of the past guest speakers and panels and what a great resource. So that, that's all I have to say, but thank you to all the education core members, Bob Gelber, Jeremy, Jeremy Wilcox, John Simlack, Kevin Lawrence, Lisa Puccio, Minna Sharp, myself, Su Susan Birnbaum, Eileen Rourke, and of course, oh, oh Emma, and everyone who contributes to education, uh, Joe Sa Savlack, I wish him a get well, and, uh, and um, that's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Nina. So the next actually is me. I'm going to be talking about um, the IT report or from the about a little bit of news about the website. Uh, we have met with Sam Cohen. We had a small little committee meeting with Sam Cohen. We had a larger committee meeting with Sam Cohen and Sam Cohen is our web, our website developer. Um, we've seen some of the redesigned pages and we'll be meeting again later this month as they're doing, you know, the moving ahead with different parts, uh, moving to the internal pages of the website. Um, the site's going to be more user-friendly. It's going to be completely updated. Um, the color scheme is basically going to be the, the similar with the reds and golds of Gannick, um, and it will still have the same kind of single sign-in. So when you log in, 
um, you'll be connected automatically to your Wild Apricot account. But um, one thing we're stressing on the homepage is the different kinds of users for the website, whether it's for members, members of the public, or tour operators. Um, and so we sort of have these kinds of, um, I'm blanking on the word, almost like a section that people, so people can direct their interest in GANIC to those respective um, parts of the homepage and they'll be directed to the um, pages internally. <clears throat> so we're working on it and we'll keep you posted when we have something to, to show everyone. I hope to have something perhaps to show the board at our next meeting, which is on February 20th, uh, but uh, we shall see. It depends what the developer uh, what Sam gets to us. But to let you know that it's just because we're quiet doesn't mean we're not doing it. Um, something will be um, coming hopefully down the pipe for the late spring, uh, early summer. So that's it from IT. So next we have industry relations down as a giving a report, but we're not sure about that. If I'm not sure if Bob, see Bob Gelber is here. Um, and so Bob, um, you can text me or let us know if you um, have a report to give. But we do have Dave Gardner, who is going to be reporting on behalf of the newsletter. So let me bring Dave Gardner on. Not as exciting on Zoom as it is in real life when Dave Gardner is coming on the screen. Uh, let's see where he is. Um, there we go. So Dave, whenever you're ready. So good morning, everybody. Can you hear me all right? My name is Dave and I am the editor of our newsletter guidelines. I'm calling in today, I say good morning because I'm here on the other side of the planet on sunny Saipan where America begins. Uh, I know we're short for time, but I do must have to point out that in that direction is the island of Tinian. If you're not knowing where that is in history, look that up, you'll, uh, you really find that look uh, part of a big story. So I am the editor of our newsletter guidelines. It's for us, by us, about us, from us. And you can write in a story for us. We do great reviews on tours, for example. There's always terrific tours going on and book reviews. If you like what Patrick, uh, you know, something Patrick Bringley might write or anybody else, please do that. Please write in. And the way to send it is at newsletter at gannick.org. So uh, that's about it for me, but, uh, oh, and yes, of course, the magic of the computer, I can work on it remotely, so I can work on frying up our newsletter, of course, from a distance. So uh, thank you, Emma, and thank you, everybody. Any questions or anything? Great, thank you. Thank you, Dave. So to confirm, what was the date again? Oh, well, actually, uh, deadlines are a little bit fluid right now. Uh, I've lately just been saying if you have something, just send it. <laughs> so for now, anything you, you okay. might have to have, just uh, please send it, of course. There's a little friend here. Can you see this? Oh, this uh... is nice. I miss having cats at Gannick meetings, so that's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I said you weren't going to make an entrance, and there you go from the other side of the world. So you've got to speed every time. So thank you, Dave. Um, yeah, and I think actually, since everyone's here, I think the next guidelines would be great to hear some reports from NFTGA, from the people who didn't report tonight, maybe the people who attended the conference and want to give a sort of more general um, feel about San Diego, um, no, I would say San Diego, San Antonio, and, um, and how that was and how that was. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, be well, Thank safe you. travels. Okay, so last but not least, we do have um, uh, from Industry Relations, we're going to have Harvey Davidson giving his report. Dave, I'll bring you back down to um, being a, a regular attendee. Thank you very much for taking time out of your vacation. <laughs> Thank you always. All right, so Harvey, when you're ready, you're on.
Okay, uh, for transparency, I'm giving this as a committee report, so I'll be referring myself in the third party tense. The Industry Relations Committee got off to a good start this year, beginning with working with the party committee and arranging for Gannick's annual end of year party at Fogo de Chao. So if you didn't get enough to eat, it's your fault. Bob Gelber and Harvey Paul Davidson met with representatives of the United Nations and arranged for upcoming FAM tours. Watch your email for the invitations and sign up as quickly as reserved places will probably fill up. The UN has also applied to be a strategic affiliation partner. Commitments for ads for the Apple Awards were obtained from a strategic affiliation partner, CIDA, and industry partner, Hershey's Chocolate World. Also, an ad was purchased by Silverstein Properties. Last year, Larry Silverstein was the lifetime is recipient of his, the award for the achievement, Lifetime Achievement Award. The March meeting is to be held at the Theater Center in Times Square, and we're still waiting or working on the Gannick meeting for April. We have a little hitch, but we're working on that. We have a commitment for the May 3rd monthly meeting to be held at Fort Hamilton Distillery, located in Brooklyn's Industry City. The distillery has a tasting room and a game room that should also provide extra enjoyment for attendees. A number of Gannick members, some with guests, attended the National Federation of Tourist Guide Associations USA biannual conference in San Antonio. We missed being the largest association in attendance by one delegate, and we were outnumbered by the DC Guild. Leading our delegation was our president, Emma Guest Gonzalez, and the NFTGA president, Michael Dillinger. Mark Landman was appointed as Gannick's delegate to the NFTGA. Others who attended were Howard and Susan Birnbaum, myself, Mark Gelber, Jared Goldstein, and Susan Solo. In addition, Jim Carr, who has dual membership in the DC Guild, and Marion Baumgarten, who resides in Amsterdam, represented Gannick. Sorry, I'm missing my notes. Davidson, along with Stephanie Simon, will represent Gannick at the International Inbound Travel Association Summit in San Diego later this month. In addition, Davidson obtained a $6,000 scholarship from NYC and Company to be part of its sales mission to Mexico in March. $6,000 is what companies pay to participate in these sales missions, and we're given that as a scholarship. Regarding the Mexican sales mission, we'd like to thank Paloma Moro Hernandez for translating Gannick information into Spanish and Mark Landman for his IT assistance, not only for this sales management sales mission, but also for his continuing help with other industry association meetings and requiring technical assistance. Mark, I really thank you. One other strategic affiliation partner joining Gannick is Tourism Cares. And that's the report for industry relations. Great, thank you very much. And um, I believe the, I thought the invitation for the UN tour had gone out already. It doesn't look like it has, so just keep your eyes open. Um, as soon as you see that, and one thing is, if there's, I'm um, sorry, sorry, Annette, I was um, chatting with Annette. Um, she was asking a question about that. So one thing is, if you see the, once you see the, um, the news about the tour, if there's a fam tour that you want to do, as soon as you get that email, sign up for it. Just, just sign up. And then if you cannot make it, make sure you cancel it on time. Okay, so it's 48 hours ahead of time. But at least sign up right away. I've done that before. I've signed up to fam tours. I'm thinking, oh, shoot, maybe I can make it. Maybe I can't make it. And um, and I've, you know, and then I've ended up canceling because I, it turns out I couldn't make it. But at least I signed up and I reserved myself the spot. So if you can attend, if you think you can attend, sign up, but you have to cancel your um, your attendance, your registration on time. Otherwise, you will be charged for it. So don't just go signing up willy-nilly. Sign up consciously, ready to know whether you're going to confirm it 